Welcome everybody, good Shabbos. Today we continue our discussion on the book of Ecclesiastes. This is part 10 of an extended series on this particular book from the Hebrew Bible. Let's dive right in. In Ecclesiastes 9 verses 2 through 4 and a partial verse 4, we see, as are the good, so are the sinners. Those who swear are like those who shun an oath. This is an evil in all that happens under the sun, that the same fate comes to everyone. But whoever is joined with all the living has hope, for a living dog is better than a dead lion. This is part of a much larger uh, exposition by the writer of Ecclesiastes. He goes into great detail about this. And I've chosen just those brief phrases that I wanted to share today and talk about. As are the good, so are the sinners. Those who swear are like those who shun an oath. Swear on what? Mar Yeshua in the Christian Testament is said to have said, don't, don't swear an oath. Don't swear an oath because we're likely to break it. The fact is, is that most humans are, most humans fluctuate. Sorry, I was looking for the right words that I wanted to say. Until we become perfect spiritually, or until we are constantly seeking perfection, it's likely that we will not sustain our determination to do the will of God, to do certain spiritual practices daily like prayer and meditation. We tend to fall on and off the wagon. And that's why we should not swear to God that we're going to do anything. Because in general, when we take a vow, most people, not all, tend to make mistakes because we all make mistakes. And they tend to stop doing what they vowed that they would do for God. So even though the, the mitzvah or the commandments are throughout the Hebrew Bible, even though we, are, we have entered a covenant, an agreement to do our best to do these commandments, we still shouldn't swear an oath. <laughs> because when we swear, I will be perfect in all these things, and then we mess up, we break that oath. And then we are liable to legal punishment, so to speak, because the covenant between God and the Israel and the people of Israel, uh, a covenant is a type of legal agreement. It's like a binding agreement between God and his people. You do these things and I will give you these things was the understanding. So both the good and the bad uh, people that are saintly and people that are still making mistakes, they are sinners as because uh, translated here, uh, neither should swear to uphold the commandments. They should just try to do their best to do every commandment, to embody every commandment. And when we don't do certain commandments of God, we should repent or try and make our way back to doing those things. Make a way, make teshuva. Teshuva means a return to God. So when we stop doing any of the commandments of God, then we we have separated our soul temporarily from God was the understanding of many Jewish traditions. And then you had to make teshuva, which means to make a return to God. And that was the idea behind the baptism of John that Jesus perpetuated after John's death through his apostles, because Jesus did not baptize himself, but he had his apostles baptize on his behalf. So what John's baptism was, and this idea was also the same with Jesus, was that whenever you were baptized, you were making a return to God. You're making a return to the way of God, which is outlined in Torah, and which is delineated in fine detail in the halakha of a particular Jewish teacher, a particular Jewish rab, or what later became understood as a rabbi. So the halakha of a teaching was their exposition, their understanding of the Torah, and what their what their disciples should do in order to fulfill the Torah. And that was what Jesus did too, despite what many contemporary Christians might think. 
many contemporary Christians think that Jesus came and established a new religion, and that's it's simply not true. Uh, Jesus was a Jew, and he said quite clearly that he came to fulfill the Torah, not to destroy it. He did, I do not come to abolish the law, which is Torah. I come to fulfill it, meaning that I am going to teach in such a way that the obligations of the Jewish people to God will be fulfilled. That is what that would have meant historically, despite distortions and uh, dogmatic or doctrinal axes that were to be ground <laughs> to make Christianity something special, something better than other religions. But Jesus was a Jew, and he taught Torah, and he taught a halakha, or teachings, that were meant to help his disciples fulfill the Torah so that they could become perfect, shalem, which means whole, and make them eligible for spiritual rebirth into the Baranash, the son of mankind, collective Messiah, or communion of saints. That's the historical teaching of Jesus. So in this case, when the writer of Ecclesiastes says that the good are the same as the sinners, that they have the same fate, that is not saying that, it, that you shouldn't do good things, that you're all going to the same place. Uh, you're making an effort to do good things, and this person is lazy or doing bad things, you're going to have the same result. That would not be fair, right? That would not be justice. One of the big things about the Jewish religion that Jesus would have taught and preached is the idea of justice, divine justice, right? So it wouldn't be just of God that somebody that is a saint that follows all the commandments would get the same end result as those that are sinners that don't do any of the commandments. That is not what the book of Ecclesiastes is saying. And of course, this is only a small excerpt from this section of chapter nine of Ecclesiastes. So I do encourage you to read the whole chapter nine to get the full picture. But what in the way that both good people and sinners fail and come under the same fate is that we all fall short of God's grace, as many Christian sects like to say. In other words, we all make mistakes. Whether it's intentional or unintentional sin, we all make a mistake. Whether we intentionally do not do a commandment of God or whether we unintentionally do not do a commandment of God, we are still guilty before God, to use heavy language, we're guilty of a sin. And sin isn't such a heavy word. Sin means to miss the mark. In the Jewish religion, when you didn't do a commandment or when you sinned, it was considered that there was a separation between your soul and God. But according to many Jewish sects and Kabbalistic developments, it was said that God was so merciful that all you had to do was say, you know, I'm really sorry for not doing this. I'm going to do better. And in that simple moment between you and God, not you and a priest <laughs> or, or you and a rabbi, it was just between you and God the way it should be, right? You say, Lord, I'm really sorry that I, I failed to do this. I don't want to let you down. I can't swear that I'm going to do everything perfectly in the future, but I will try my best to fulfill the commandments. I'm going to focus. I'm going to try to do better. Please bring me close to you and inspire me with your divine grace so I could fulfill Torah and the teachings of my master, Jesus. That would be how I would pray to God when I break commandments, when I fall short, when I miss the mark, right? So this is the evil that happens under the sun and is the same fate of everyone, that whether we are good and really focusing on God or we are missing the mark, we're a sinner, we're not there yet. We're not focused. Nobody should swear an oath because we all fail. We all make mistakes. And our fate is that there is a consequence for that mistake if we don't make ourselves right with God, which is the idea of righteousness. Righteousness doesn't mean that you have your nose up in the air and you're looking down at people. A righteous saint is one that... A saint is a sinner that never gave up. They kept on getting up, they kept on trying, they kept on making it right with God until they became consistent 
enough for God to say, okay, my child, <laughs> I pass you. I realize you'll never be perfect, but you're past. You have a pure heart. I'm letting you move on to the next level of, uh, of the divine schoolhouse. So that is what everybody, what the same faith, what the same faith is, is that we are all destined to fall short of the grace of God. We are all destined to miss the mark, to make a mistake and to have to make it right with God. And the major difference between a good seeker and a sinner that's not seeking God at all is that the seeker will keep on coming back. They'll keep falling down. They'll keep getting up. They, they have enthusiasm for the spiritual path. They have confidence that one day they will get to that 99.9999999% of fulfilling the teachings of their spiritual teacher, such as Mar Yeshua. The last sentence here says, but whoever is joined with all the living has hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. What an interesting phrase to end this whole discourse on. The living means spiritually alive saints. So whoever joined with all the living has hope. The living are the spiritually living within God in the Alam Haba, or the, the spiritual world to come. And many Jewish sects had different ideas. Some Jewish sects believed that the Olam Haba was a heavenly sphere beyond this one. Others felt that a Messiah might come and create a new earth here, that God's new Jerusalem would come on earth. There were Jewish people that believed that also. And that became basically the... Both of those are highly conflated and mixed together in contemporary Christian thought, too. Uh, my viewpoint, personally, based off of my studies, is that the Alam Haba, uh, my perspective, not everybody's perspective, is that the Alam Haba is a spiritual reality. This planet will never be perfect, and it will never be fully spoiled. It's a, mixed, it's a mixed pot. It's a churning pot in which spiritual seekers are being churned. They're being tossed around so they can be purified. And once that soul is purified, my understanding of different uh, interpretations of scripture and different things from the wisdom traditions and intertestamental literature and how those two things would have influenced the teachings of Jesus that we now have in the Christian Testament is that the living, which are spiritually purified souls, exist in a different reality at a higher frequency in higher olams or spiritual spheres, which we often can make a generic word and call them heaven or heavens but olamim are different levels of spiritual realities and not all olamim are good. For example, in both the Enochian and Isaiah scheme of olam or olamim, plural, olamim is plural form of olam. In the third olam, both the Garden of Eden, heaven, and Gehenna, what is commonly called hell, exist in the same sphere. They're in the same olam. And all the other alums have different uh, spiritual beings, and not all of them are exalted. <laughs> in fact, some of them are being punished in some of these schemes to some degree or another. So olam shouldn't necessarily mean in your mind heaven as in paradise, uh, where most people want to go when they're Christians. Olamim just means a different sphere of reality than this earthly one in which we do not possess a physical body, but we possess some form of spiritual body with which to experience those more ethereal realms or realms that are beyond our current perception. So it says, whoever is joined with the spiritual living in some higher spiritual olam has hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. So how do we join ourselves in this current state where we have a material body? How do we join ourselves with 
the living, which we could call the communion of saints or purified sadakim, perfected Jewish sages. They exist in a higher spiritual sphere, which Jesus called the son of man, the Baranash. The son of man was a corporate Messiah, a corporate, a corporate new humanity, people that had, that had purified themselves from selfishness to selflessness, from couldn't care less to pure love for all living beings. How do we join ourselves to the son of mankind collective Messiah, to perfected spiritual saints? By doing Torah, by doing the halakha of your spiritual teacher, such as Mar Yeshua, in the case of Christianity. For a living dog, what is a dog? A dog is a loving servant, isn't it? Anybody that has a dog knows that our dogs love unconditionally. But they tend to also be a type of servant to humans, a type of companion. So a living dog, which is a spiritualized human who has the characteristics of pure love for God and considers him or herself a servant of God, is better than a dead lion. In other words, a spiritually dead person, somebody that shouts and boasts about <laughs> how great they are. Uh, a lion is also a leader, you know. It's somebody that is all about me. A lion is proud, right? They even call it a pack of lions a pride, right? So spiritually dead people have a lot of pride, like a lion. They consider themselves to be great. They hold up their, their head and they look strong. But inside, there's, there's nothing of value in there. So a spiritually living servant is so much better than a very loud, spiritually dead, prideful human. So giving up spiritual pride and living a humble, purely loving life with an attitude of servitude towards God and being a loving servant of all of humanity is what is required for us to be joined to, be tethered to, be yoked with the living, the communion of saints. And then whenever we transition from this body, we have an opportunity to join that community of saints. That is the idea of spiritual regeneration or spiritual rebirth that Mar Yeshua talked about. So Ecclesiastes 9, 7 through 8, go eat your bread with enjoyment and drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has long ago approved what you do. Let your garments always be white, and do not let, and do not let oil be lacking on your head. We'll start with the second underlined phrase first. Let your garments always be white. Do not let oil be lacking on your head. Our garments are our physical bodies. So it says, let your body always be white. It's not white skin. White is a symbol of purity. So it's saying, let your body and the actions that come forth from your body or that are done by your body be pure. And do not let the oil be lacking on your head. Oil is a symbol of love. Oil is a symbol of love. So the best way of interpreting this phrase, in my opinion, in my spiritual understanding, is let your body and the actions of your body always be white or pure. And do not let love be lacking on your head or within your head or within your mind within your consciousness, right? We tend to intellectualize and reason and rationalize with our head, but if we want to grow or evolve spiritually, we have to have our mind, our consciousness be pure, full of pure love, not only for God, but for all of creation, for all of humanity. Those are the requirements. So when we have purity of body and action, we have love in our hearts and our consciousness within our heads, then God gives a reward. And that is poetically described as eat your bread with enjoyment and drink your, drink your wine with merriment, right? So uh, the, the first sentence represents that by living a pure and loving and simple life, God rewards us with happiness, with enjoyment with nurturance on all levels. And that's what these verses mean. So it's quite beautiful. 
So the next verse is talk about the fact that spiritual progress can only be made while incarnated, while having a physical body. So in Ecclesiastes 9.10, it says, whatever your hand finds to do, do with your might, for there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you are going. So in Jewish thought, and apparently to the right, to the thought of Ecclesiastes, there was only one place where people go and they die, which seems very interesting to many modern Jews and to probably all Christians. Uh, there was only one place that everybody went, whether they were good, bad, or neutral. After death, we all went to Sheol, which was the spiritual underworld. So when you look here to the left, the, the Jewish concept of creation was such as this. There was uh, the firmament of the sky and the earth, which is the land we live on. And under the earth was Sheol, which is where all disembodied or dead people went. And then beneath Sheol was the columns that support the whole earth, so to speak. And they envisioned that the whole earth or the whole creation was was surrounded by spiritual waters and we see the same kind of idea in different world scriptures like the srimad bhagavatam which talks about different spiritual waters and oceans of milk and etc that surround the land the earth so not only jews believe this but many other people believe this and we tend to take things so literally. There is probably a lot of spiritual interpretation in this that uh, some people know and some people don't know. So we shouldn't take this literally and think, oh, all those uneducated Jews of history. Everything means something. There is not a lack of meaning. So, for example, the, the spiritual waters are like a womb that holds the earth, right? We are all in amniotic fluid in our mother's womb as we are growing. So one way of understanding the spiritual waters that surround and support the earth is that we are in the womb of God. We're being supported and nurtured by God if we'd only let ourselves be led by that divine way, right? So getting a little bit off topic, coming back, but essentially what all the Jews thought at least early on, and it did develop over time. Many Jews do believe in a hellish sphere, Gehenna, and uh, a heavenly realm, the Garden of Eden. Many believe in that now, but in earlier Jewish thought, and apparently what the writer of Ecclesiastes believed based off of this verse, uh, there is the idea of Sheol. And that is where all spiritual souls went and it was kind of a shadowy realm and so it was kind of like a neutral place where everybody went after dead after death you didn't you didn't go to heaven god and angels were in heaven and all deceased souls went to sheol so after death it wasn't that we got to go up and hang out with the angels and hang out with god that wasn't the understanding of early jews Later on, that did develop in that direction, and we don't have time to talk about how that transition happened here, uh, but maybe in future classes we'll discuss it. But at this point in Jewish history, they believed in a spiritual underworld, Sheol, where all souls went, whether they were saints or sinners. So this could also be what it was meant in earlier verses that their fate is the same. Whether you were good or bad, you all went to the divine spiritual underworld. But in different parts of the Hebrew Bible, I believe in Ezekiel, there is a discussion of, about the fact that there are different levels in Sheol. Even though Sheol is completely in the underworld, as a spiritual underworld, it was understood that there were different levels of Sheol, uh, which developed into the ideas of heaven and hell, etc. Negative spiritual realms for negative souls and positive uplifting joyful spiritual realms for good people you know this idea began to develop within the prophetic literature that there were different levels of sheol that there was places for good people and places for sinners and places for really bad people that did develop but 
However, the writer of Ecclesiastes perceived Sheol to be, he doesn't discuss, at least not at this point, uh, he says that everybody goes there. And that once we go there, we cannot develop ourselves and make ourselves better humans. We cannot spiritually evolve after the time of death. So whatever your hands do, whatever your physical body does, do it with your might. Do it right. Do it in accordance with God's laws. For there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol to which you are going. Meaning that whatever Sheol was or understood to be by the ancient Jews, whatever level of spiritual attainment you had, before death and at the, at the moment of death was all that you had. Once you transition to Sheol, there was no way to improve your spiritual condition. You were that way, you were that way, that was it. You can't evolve in the spiritual afterlife was the idea of the early Jews. And I don't wanna go beyond that because many Jews did believe in reincarnation. Many Jews today believe in reincarnation, and it's apparent that Jesus believed in, in reincarnation when you read the Christian Testament. There are many verses that you just can't pass up. He literally says that John the Baptist was Elijah. <laughs> so he, he's very definitive that Jesus believed in, in reincarnation. And many Jews of Jesus's time and many Jews today believe in reincarnation too, based off of their interpretation of the scriptures. So Sheol wasn't necessarily a place where you would be eternally. But when you were there, you couldn't, for whatever length of time your soul might be in this afterworld, the spiritual underworld, you couldn't do anything. And those who felt that it was eternal, you were, you were there eternally. And those that felt that you reincarnated, you could then reincarnate and continue your spiritual progress. But it wasn't until the prophets came around, the Isaiahs, the Ezekiels, whenever they did their chariot ascent to the throne of God, it was only then that humanity was able to access God. God was always kind of absent in a sense, except he only spoke to the people of Israel through the prophets, through Moses, etc. cetera. Uh, and it only became apparent that you could, that a human could actually go to heaven and see God and his angels and the different spiritual olamim with the prophets. And after that time of the divine chariot ascent of Ezekiel and Isaiah, and what is described in the intertestamental literature of Enoch, did the ideas of distinct heavens and hells occur. But the idea of whatever your hands find to do that means whatever work you do, whatever you do in the world, whether it is physical work or thought, like a scientist, for example, or a religious teacher, or knowledge or wisdom, you can only develop yourself through these actions by spiritualizing them and offering them to God while you're living. But after you die, whether you consider that death to be eternal or whether you consider reincarnation to be something for you, after you die, whatever that state is, while in Sheol, while in heaven or hell, you know, those ideas developed, you can't change once you're there. And I've often said this, and I don't mean to be disrespectful to the memory of anybody's loved ones, but a lot of people will have a difficult parent that was abusive, mentally, emotionally, physically. And then once they die, they go through a grieving process because that was still their parent. And that same person that was abused viciously by their parent will say, oh, he or she's an angel now in heaven. It's not how it works. Whatever you attain to in life is what you will remain in the afterlife. We don't become angels or some divine being just because we died. Everybody, good or bad, has the same fate. The writer of Ecclesiastes said that earlier. We all go, we all die. And in this, this period of time in Judaism, all went to Sheol, whether good or bad. Right? So, some things to think about. 
Our last verses for the day are from Ecclesiastes 9, 17 through 18. And it talks about the, necess the necessity of discriminating between somebody who's wise and somebody who's just prideful. So again, this idea between a humble, meek, spiritual soul and that lion, right? That boastful, that dead lion, that spiritually dead, prideful, selfish person. So we come back kind of to that idea in these verses. The quiet words, the wise, are more to be heeded than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one bungler destroys much good. Right? So the quiet, humble, spiritualized words, the wise, are to be heeded more than the shouting of a ruler who is popular among many, many fools, right? So this is the idea of, you know, not being a sheep that follows the masses. Those who are truly worth listening to are few in the world. But yet we run after these political leaders, these spiritual gurus that aren't a real guru, mind you. Uh, there are many great spiritual masters, great spiritual gurus that are authentically one with God in the world. However, I'm speaking of somebody that just calls themselves a guru and doesn't deserve the name. So many people follow these spiritual gurus of all religions they follow these political leaders that take them off the edge into craziness. I'm going to go there. People that support Donald Trump are part of that pack. And I'm quite sure that anybody that, that supports Donald Trump isn't listening to this anyhow. So it's not gonna, like I'm going to lose some viewer. <laughs> so, the quiet words, the wise are more to be listened to than the one that is shouting, listen to me, listen to me, I know everything, I'm perfect. I'm the best at this, I'm the best at that. I know, God, you should be just like me. People that shout like that, you should run away from, whether it's political, uh, religious, <laughs> any way that it, any form that it shows up in, run. Somebody that is more quiet, that is radiating joy, and you walk up to them and you say, how are you so happy? And if they give you a few quiet words as to why they're so happy, that is somebody wise and they are to be heeded in whatever sphere of life they live in, whether it's the family life, the religious life, political life, et cetera. One who is quiet, that truly listens, that is happy, that makes others happy, Ask them how they became that way. And they'll respond in a very humble way. That is the person to be listened to. Not the person that shouts among fools. Look at me. Be like me. Think like me. Don't think for yourself. Be careful. They have to discriminate. That's part of the spiritual path. Part of spiritual evolution is to be able to have a bullshit meter. You're able to have a spiritual sensitivity that this sounds like truth. And oh, that sounds self-serving, doesn't it? We have to learn to think and feel and intuit for ourselves and then develop acceptance of that whole picture. Wisdom, true wisdom is better than weapons of war. So diplomacy is better than fighting. Accepting a situation is better than perpetuating negative vibrations. But one bungler destroys so much good. Again, I just cite Donald Trump. One idiot destroys, can destroy a whole democracy. When a relative few priests from the Roman Catholic tradition started abusing children sexually, that one bungler or the relative few caused a lot of people to leave a tradition, a spiritual tradition. It's unfortunate, right? 
when one spiritual person from any religion does something bad, the whole world says, oh, well, all religions should be thrown out with the bathwater. So one fool that does stupid stuff can really destroy and damage good things, whether it's political, religious, or any sphere of life, right? So we should do our best to always do right, to always have just beautiful actions imbued with love, imbued with selflessness to the best of our ability. We should always consider before we do something, does this lead myself and others forward on the spiritual path and the path of goodness, or does it lead it away from the same? We should really try to discriminate. Is this thought, is this word, is this deed, is it going to cause harm to others and do our best not to cause harm? Because one bungler, one person making a big mistake destroys so much good that was done. Again, I'm not trying to be catty or anything. I realize that I'm part of an alternate stream to the Orthodox Christianity that exists. Even though the Christianity that I teach and that the organization that I come from, the Home Temple teaches, is historical. It's actually probable history according to non-biased biblical scholarship. We think of Pope John Paul as being so saintly. There's pictures of him everywhere when you go into different churches. They consider him a saint. But he knew priests were raping little boys, and he did nothing. He did nothing to save face. To make his religion look pure. John Paul, that was an evil action. He is no saint. No saint would let that happen. If you were a righteous saint, you'd be like Jesus going through all the churches in every country with your whip and saying, get the hell out of here. All of you people that raped boys, you are defrocked. You are gone. I'm purifying my church. Get out of here. That's what he should have said, but instead he hid them and he moved them around churches so they could rape more boys. And then all the lesser bishops, because that's all the Pope is, is a glorified bishop. They all followed him. They hid people, moved them around so they can rape more kids and destroy lives. And those relative few people that did this damage, because 99% of priests in the Roman Catholic tradition are doing their best, according to what they believe. But that 1% or less, they destroyed so much good. Wouldn't it have been braver of Pope John Paul to say, get the hell out of here and don't come back. I'm making sure all of you are defrocked and put in prison where you belong. That's what he should have done, not hide the evidence. I pray that the bishops of this tradition that I represent, the Holy Apostolic Order of the Home Temple, if they ever find out anything that somebody is abusing a person on any level, especially sexual, that they defrock them and they send them right to the freaking police. Get them the mental health they need, but put them in prison so they can't harm somebody, whether child or adult. I hope our tradition has that maturity now, as I believe it does, and all the way into all futurity. <laughs> so... May we be brave enough to protect those we seek to help, right? But one bungler or a handful of bunglers can do a lot of damage to the faith of so many. May all of our spiritual leaders protect children and adults and protect their tradition by eradicating all the black sheep that are out there, the wolves in sheep's clothing. Second cup of blessing. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother of the Universe, thank you for this time together that we're sharing, for this knowledge that we're sharing. 
may we become dedicated to you, dedicated to doing tor doing the teachings of the Torah to the best of our ability, doing the teachings of Mar Yeshua with our whole heart, our whole strength, our whole soul. Even if we never become perfect, does anybody become absolutely perfect? I'm not sure. But let us seek that. Let us seek greater perfection, greater illumination, greater light, greater love every day. May we do what's right because it's right to do. May we call out injustice and darkness wherever we see it with compassion and mercy, but with firmness. Amen. 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 Thank you, everybody, for coming. Good Shabbos. I look forward to seeing you next Friday or on Sundays for the Liturgy of the Chalice. Have a beautiful weekend and enjoy this next, this Shabbat period of 24 hours. Try to rest in God. Try to focus on God. Try to become one with God, one with his love, one with his light, one with his guiding wisdom. Let's do our best and forget the rest. Amen.